People in the scientific community were doing all the things. I'm very ignorant. It did when you first you know, introduced the conception of nanotechnology, nanoscience. It's thick. <laughs> and I think it's something that since then I've thought about more and been much more aware of. And it is amazing how it is in everyday products and it is in everyday life. And you pick up a newspaper and you read about it. And even things with like there's a new nano iPod. Isn't there, I don't know, I mean, but is there a danger sometimes that you can sort of get um, carried away in trying to solve a problem, a particular scientific problem, and then and sort of like lose sight of where this is all going. In terms of like you get so focused, <laughs> but you like get so focused on solving a particular thing that you're working on that you actually lose sight of where it's going. You know, you're all sitting here saying you're doing the right. You know, you didn't want to go into explosive, whatever, and that's fine. But it's like you just need one scientist who's got no morals, and you know what's going to happen. Well, that's that's exa that's exactly the thing. So so it's really up to us to to kind of. Uh, Is it not to use individuals as scientists to say right? We've gone this far, and we only want it used in this way. I mean, how? What we've said is there's no body to stop it. I think my biggest fear is that it won't work and it will not live up to its promises. Um, but then all these other potentially weird and wonderful applications, so that that's okay. Obviously, yeah, I've got I'm some. Surprised that your concern is that it won't work, and that your concern isn't the possible use of it. Because there's difficult work to be done and you're going to have to spend some time doing some discussions and drawing some lines and making some boundaries. And I think, it's, you know, as you say, it's right that we start have these discussions early enough that you can get those done in time. But I don't think that's a reason for, for, for not moving the technology forward. I, I think this aim of getting you know, everybody in the world living comfortably in a sustainable way is really, really important. And I am convinced that that needs technology to do it. And the reason I'm convinced it needs technology to do it is because I know that we need technology now to live as we are, and the technology we've got is not good enough. One of the key findings from, from all of this work is that the questions raised by nanotechnologies aren't specific to nano, uh, that they're actually wider questions about the governance of science and technology, about ownership, control, responsibility. Uh, and so one of the challenges going forward is how you connect these kind of insights to the development of policy, both in the nano domain and then more widely uh, in, in, in terms of, of science and technology policy. So I think you need to to be quite clear that before something becomes a manufactured product and it's out in the marketplace, it has to be safe. And, well, okay, as within the limits, within parameters, and within a sensible area. But somebody has has got to take responsibility for saying that this minimum level of testing has to be performed. I, I think as long as I'm honest, I say, look. I can do this, I can see it could do a lot of good potentially, um, and I can't see any serious way at the moment which it could be misused, then that would be fine. But for me to say it can't be misused I think would be wrong. And for me to take away the, the decision from the public, so you're not going to have any of the benefits or any of the drawbacks, I think you have to let people be sensible. Yeah, but I, I don't think you can ask the scientists to make the decision. I think you're quite right about that, but I think there is somebody who does need to take some responsibility for it. There is a gap there between the science and 
the use of the, of the signs. I think that's the dangerous sort of cabin where you can go from one thing to its actual use, and that there isn't really any limitation on that. There is no bad science. There is only bad application of that sort of science. We hope that this would have an impact uh, certainly on the nanoscientists who were involved in the process and also the publics and they would actually go away uh, taking with them a sense of the possibilities that emerge from this kind of dialogue and that that I think was very much very much the case the scientists were very animated by the process they indeed had much opportunity uh, to talk through or th to think through the social and ethical implications of their activities and and I think that was that was very much a um, successful um, effect impact arising from from out of the project. Mm -hmm. I really think about thing, especially for us sitting here, we admitted it. We've been chatting before. And it's quite nice that at the end of the day, we can relate to them as real people, and they, they do have the same fears. <laughs> <laughs> Like scientists do science for science's sake, industry makes money for industry's sake, marketing departments market things because that's their job, but who's carrying the book? Who, at the end of the day, is, is being responsible, responsible for this? Can't the scientific community use their power in a way so that they say, well, actually, before we go, go any further or do whatever with this, we actually want to consult the general public? Do they, can they do that, or do, would they do that? Or? I'm not the one developing the technology, I'm the scientist. And so I'm not the one making the decision of how it is applied. And the risk is carried actually in the application itself and not in the science mostly. And so that's why they, they can seem a bit unethical or remote and say, listen, this is not my game. Well, that's sort of going back to what you were saying about the journalists and everything. Just, you know, if you, if you just use your money that you're given just to give it to journalists and say, oh, well, we'll just tell them that, you're not getting anything back from us. And surely that's probably what communication should be a two way thing, not just this one way system. <laughs> A lot of people have said that it's very difficult to have this kind of conversation between scientists and the public, um, particularly in an area where the technology is still um, at an early stage, it's still developing. Um, there's an assumption that this will somehow require uh, publics to uh, go into the laboratory and peer over the shoulders of scientists interfering with their work. Um, and we wanted to show that no, you could actually do this um, in an anticipatory early way and you could do it in a way that enabled quite a fruitful productive conversation between scientists and, and members of the public and I think the work we've done has, has demonstrated that you know that, that that can happen. The things that worried the people in my focus group were the things that worried me you know and I, I am uncertain about how lots of this stuff will turn out I mean I have a kind of positive view about how I'd like it to turn out but you know I can there are people who who have opinions about how it ought to turn out that I really don't like at all and it's kind of quite reassuring to think that I'm not alone in <laughs> worrying about the things that I worry about. Because I came as a, as a sort of late person thinking that somehow there was, a, there was a big scientific plan for nanotechnology but there isn't of course, no. it's just an evolving thing. And Decisions aren't made, it's assumptions that are made and then we look back in time and say oh a decision was made back then when really it was, a, it was an assumption. It, it's the same sort of things I, I worry about when I'm not being a scientist. Mm. And, and in a way, that's quite nice that the whole scene that actually I'm not as detached from the real world as possibly I might have thought I was. Chemistry is one.